So we start with Joshua Castellino, um, former dean of Middlesex University um, in London, born in India, and now um, executive director of uh, one of the long, uh, uh, one of the most traditional human rights organizations, the minority, the minority rights group in London. Uh, thank you that you're here, Joshua. I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's, it's an honor to be here and to share this platform with two incredible activists from two different parts of the world who have made such an impact. You know, it's instructive that uh, Wolfgang finished on the note of hope. Just reflect on the fact that 130 years ago, in this city, probably in this setting, a bunch of European countries got together and thought, you know what, we are fighting each other in Africa, let's create a bunch of rules. Those bunch of rules were captured in something that we refer to as the Berlin West Africa Conference, 134 years ago, 130 years ago, 1884. And the Berlin West Africa Conference essentially used law to legitimize the, decolon the, the colonization and the exploitation of the rest of the world. The three C's they called it, Christianity, commerce, and civilization. Civilization included the kinds of things you're going to see and hear about today from our Namibian activists and artists. If that is civilization, then that's a really terrible civilization. Commerce is what you see the protest about outside. The commerce that was inflicted upon the rest of the world came in the form of multinational corporations eager to seize resources, eager to exploit resources, and eager to take wealth out of Africa, Asia, and Latin America and bring it here to Europe. But this is a source of hope, colleagues. We are here in the same place today with a mass protest outside that is making everybody aware of what that commerce has done. We are here inside this remarkable building, a few doors down from the seat of power. Now, I don't mean the Brandenburg Gate. I mean the US Embassy. Here we are, and we are talking about accountability. Now, if that's not a source of hope, I don't know what is. But the key, I think, for what many of these issues is we've got to start from the perspective that law has been used as an instrument by the powerful to protect the interests of the powerful. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights that Wolfgang referred to, that is now 70 years ago, tried to change that dynamic. It said, you know what, this is not about order, it's about justice. It's not about just order, it's about a just order. It's about an order that recognizes justice. Colonization would not have happened if the legal principles that existed had been adhered to. The legal principles that existed in Europe already made a distinction between subjects and objects. This is an object. I can move it. I can drink from it. God forbid, I can even throw it to the ground and smash it. It's an object. It doesn't need to consent. Human beings are subjects. If you're going to do something to them, you better get their consent. You better understand what exists before. African, Asian, and Latin American territories were not terra nullius, blank territories, when Europeans arrived. They were occupied territories. According to public international law, therefore, there was no right to engage on these territories. That doesn't mean Europeans were not welcome. It just means you couldn't rule the house. You couldn't take it over and decide it's yours any more than the property regimes here in Berlin or in London or in Paris would allow you to do that. So before we move any further, let's just acknowledge one thing. Colonial crime is one tiny element of the state of the world's countries today. Let's not get post-colonial states off the hook here. We have had 60, 70, 80 years to mend some of this stuff, and we have been unable to do it too. So this is not just about, let's blame a bunch of white guys for all our problems. That has to be acknowledged, but that is, you have to locate colon colonial crimes within what's happening. I think it's important to say that. We are not here to blame the past. We are here to get a better future, just like the people outside the Brandenburg Gate are. This is about trying to rethink it. Now, one of the aspects to, to some of this issue is that there are a whole bunch, we are told, of legal reasons why we can't address questions of colonial crime. We are told, oh, it was a long time ago. The rules didn't exist at that time. How do you decide compensation? Who puts a price on it? 
Who pays for it? Why should a German taxpayer today pay for something that was happened 115 years ago in Namibia? These are all valid questions, but I want to make two points to you. First, the fact is that the legal tools do exist. People like Wolfgang and others in this room, Alejandra, Gaston, Colin, other people here, human rights lawyers have used law to get exactly that justice. And they have not let minor distinctions about how the law has been constructed by the powerful get in the way of that. So the law and the legal tools do exist. It's a question of your political willingness to accept that this edifice of law that we all bow down to is in fact as clear cut as we think it is. So the tools do exist. And if it was a different legal, uh, legal audience, I would be talking to you about subjects and objects. I would be talking to you about intertemporal rule of law. I would be talking to you about legitimate title to territory. Believe me, the tools do exist to rethink this. That's the first and important element to, to stress there. The other ele important element I'd like to, to, to make you really be aware of is that when we talk about remedies, it goes beyond just paying for stuff. There are other things that have to happen. What I want to do very briefly, because I, I think this, this conference really is about trying to listen to Namibians. My role here is to set the scene. I want to offer you seven different types of colonial crimes, a typology of seven different types of colonial crimes. I won't have time to go into them. First of all is this failure to recognize other human beings as being human. Wolfgang said it. Makua Matua said it. Can Germans accept that Namibians are human beings? Can everybody accept that actually, irrespective of the color of your skin, irrespective of your belief, whether you eat meat or don't eat meat, whether you bow to the West or you bow to the East, can we accept the fact that actually we are inherently equal in dignity and worth? That's a fundamental question at the root cause of this. And the failure to accept that is at the root of colonial crime. It's at the absolute root. A second type of, and there are a number of different elements to that. There are a number of elements that basically talk about the extent to which bullets were used in Calcutta, for instance, scatter guns. And bu these bullets were used that shredded human beings. They were not just bullets that kill. They ripped apart people. And Lord Salisbury stood up in, the, in, the, in a famous discussion in the House of Parliament in, in Britain and said, you know what? We are fighting savages. We need to destroy them. This is like going into a, a forest and destroying its biodiversity. Also, by the way, something that has happened regularly. So we've got to think about those types of crimes. We've got to think about the crimes of the acquisition of territory. How was territory acquired? How did that happen? How did that process go ahead? What were the legal norms? Cecil Rhodes apparently went up to the Shona King in Zimbabwe and exchanged, he gave him a bunch of cloth. The Zimbabwean Shona King accepted Cecil Rhodes and accepted this as some kind of a tribute. What the Shona King didn't realize is they had, he had now sold his land entirely to Cecil Rhodes, who now declared, of course, Rhodesia. So there are these kinds of notions that are in our history that have not been acknowledged. Those need to be acknowledged. Then there are episodic crimes during colonial rule. And the 115 years ago, the genocide we're talking about fits that perfectly. These kinds of massacres that took place where individuals and communities were not recognized as being that. They were just in the way of the land. They were just in the way of the diamonds. They were just in the way of the biodiversity that could be exploited. There are those kinds of episodic crimes. And international law has developed a huge series of mechanisms for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. But there are also crimes of systemic and widespread nature. Those systemic and widespread nature, the best one I can think about at the moment, for instance, is this idea of environmental destruction that came with it. Fortress conservation. We are dealing with a case at Minority Rights Group in, in the Congo, in the Congo Basin, the oldest part of Africa, the civilization, the cradle of civilization that was inhabited by a community that you might know as pygmy. We don't use pygmy anymore because of the connotations of the word. We call them batwa. But those batwa were kicked out of the Congo Basin because apparently this was supposed to be a nature reserve. It wasn't a nature reserve. It was an exclusive zone where King Leopold could go hunting elephants. That's what it was for. But we have inherited this in the 21st century. Fortress conservation as an idea now is, ah, human beings have done terrible devastation to the planet. Let's kick them out of the forest. It's not those human beings who did the damage. They were the ones who protected it. 
They were the ones who lived in harmony with it. Actually, what has happened in the Batwa case is taking the Batwa out of the, out of the DRC, out of the PKNB, which is the forest in and around Kivu, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, taking them out has allowed loggers to move in, has allowed poachers to move in. The German government today still has supported eco-guards who maintain that particular forest. So this is not about, oh, those crimes that happened long ago. There's a legacy to these crimes that has continued in policies like that. These crimes have contemporary relevance. Capital punishment is another example of that. Capital punishment came to many former British colonial countries through the British who decided that ultimately the only way to punish people was to put them to death, to use the death penalty. That didn't exist in traditional systems. There are also support for wrongful acts post-independence. Let's not forget that. There's a continuing legacy of these kinds of issues which don't give us problems with the intertemporal rule of law. These are contemporary issues today that need to be addressed. So on to the remedies, my last two or three minutes. There's a set of things. When, when people talk about colonial crime, a whole bunch of other people roll their eyes and say, now you're going to ask us for money. Yeah, some of it is money, not all of it. Acceptance of wrongfulness is key. Acceptance of wrongfulness of exactly what happened. Not just a blanket mea culpa for everything, let us off the hook, we want to go home. It's an acceptance of specific episodes and specific elements that are featured in this. It requires an investigation, a historical verification. And it's not just, by the way, to get Namibian history right for Namibia. Namibians can do that. Where in, the, where in German history books is this massacre? Is it there? Are young Germans studying about it? In the context of Britain, and I live in London now, there is nothing. My kids who are 14 and 12 are learning about Henry VII's eight wives. I'm not sure if it's Henry VII's eight wives or Henry VIII's seven wives, <laughs> but something like that. Indian colonization is an afterthought. It's not even there. Where is that? No wonder people in Britain think that these bloody foreigners are taking away the land and killing it. They don't realize that actually the people who are in Britain have followed colonial rule back to it. People need to understand that. They need to understand the modern society and the history of communities that live within modern contemporary European societies from the perspectives of that historical lens and not just from a narrow perspective trying to redefine who we are in the 21st century by pretending colonization didn't happen. So you can't pick, as I guess Sarkozy tried to do a while ago, to define French values that relate to the 17th century while failing to realize that the 200 years after that played an e equally important role in contemporary France. So that's an important element. The reparations idea, of course, addressing wrongful policy, correcting wrongful policy, putting in place measures that will do that. Restitution, return of that property. How was that property achieved? How was that property gained? There are mechanisms now for restitution. Return of cultural artifacts. The British Museum of Theft, as I call it, in London. Yeah, okay, these memorials have all been preserved for a long time and we are grateful, but they need to be given back. And they need to find a way to recognize that and to get it back so that everybody can enjoy that legacy and realize their own history. Compensation, one of the five elements among them. There has to be a way of finding compensation. Compensation for wrongful act, but also compensation through evolved thinking on development funding. The 0.7 GDP that all of the European states pay in, where does that go to? Who does that benefit? Does it address? some of these legacy questions. Those need to be asked. And finally, I think solidarity-oriented remedies. Remedies to, from European states, and I would, I would hope Germany could lead that, that particular process. Remedies from European states that tackle the unfair trading system, that tackle the unfairness that still exists in world financial institutions, that treat much of Africa, Latin America, and Asia as a raw, as a bed for raw materials, that can be improved in a value chain and sold for fabulous eye-watering prices in, in, the, in Europe and, the, and North America with very little return to the places they come from, with no expectation of the fact that we are ultimately exploiting a finite resource and that when that finite resource goes, there will be nothing left behind for those communities. So Wolfgang gave me the job of setting the scene. I hope I've done that. I think three messages just to reiterate. If we had followed a strict legal process, it would be impossible to have colonization. We didn't. Law was used as an instrument to dispossess. 
but law can also be used as an instrument to repossess. We have to think that through. Law is an instrument for order, but it's also an instrument for justice. We have the legal tools at our behest. We have, in the work of so many people you'll see and hear about today, we have the intellectual drive, the innovation, and the creativity to link into the empathy of reasonable thinking people, as all of you are, and I suspect all of the people in front of the Brandenburg Gate are. We need to join those together because, as Johannes said at the start, this is actually not about the past. It's actually about the future, and it's all to play for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joshua. And I think, uh, Sima, we can agree that he laid some grounds for the following discussions. Um, Sima Leupert is um, one of the most important leaders of the NAMA community in Namibia. Uh, her official title is Deputy Chairperson of the NAMA Traditional Leaders uh, Association Technical Committee on Genocide. Uh, so welcome, Sima. And, uh, Good to have you here. We had uh, Sima as well as many others um, in, in Namibia during the Week of Justice, and she was actually one of the key persons also addressing the, the contradictions within the post-colonial um, um, society in, in Namibia itself. So looking forward to hear from you, Sima. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, before I start, want to acknowledge a very important personality whom I regard as my mother. Um, she is the pioneer um, when it comes to addressing the issue of genocide, Mama Ida Hoffman. I consider her my mother. I consider her my mother because she is the sister of my mother. So when you are the sister of, if, if she is the sister of your mother, then she is also your mother. Um, as always, I'm quite nervous, naturally nervous, when I'm asked to speak about a topic that is so personal to me. In the end of the day, genocide for those who feel its impact on a daily basis is a very personal experience. It is almost nerve-wracking when it becomes as personal as the mass murder of your family members. Um, it requires deep introspection, which makes your heart beat a little bit faster than it usually should be beating. In the case of the Nama and the Ovaherero genocide, I often ask myself, why do we need to have to write books or make public lectures or argue in courts, or convince politicians in order for our pain to be understood and for our calls for justice to be respected. It is almost as if we are asked to justify why it should be called genocide, as if the onus is on us to prove that it was indeed genocide. The perpetrator seems innocent until the victim proves otherwise. It is like a woman who is raped and the onus is on her to prove that she was raped before justice can be done. Something is fundamentally wrong when the perpetrator remains innocent until the victim proves otherwise. It is almost as if the legal system is written for the purpose of protecting the powerful. I am not a lawyer neither do I have any legal knowledge, but my common sense tells me that the law is purposefully written in such a way that I, as an ordinary woman, must find it almost impossible to protect my rights. I am probably expected to speak today as an intellectual, analyzing the Nama and Ovaherero genocide from an academic perspective, and in so doing, bring a degree of objectivity. But I choose not to do so because it becomes almost impossible 
to be entirely objective when the matter hits right at the core of your being. So I want to share with you the stories of two women who directly experienced the Nama and the Ovaherero genocide. Perhaps it is stories like these that will help us to understand that the genocide involved real people, not some fictitious characters from a Hollywood horror movie. I am the great-granddaughter of a woman who survived Shark Island. I vividly remember Omama, as we called her, because my grandmother used to nurse her during the last years of her life. As children, we had to carry water into the room so that my granny would bathe her, or we would be asked to wash her clothes, or light the fire so that my grandmother would make her soup. I remember Omama as a very frail old woman, almost an antique piece of artwork. It was only after Omama passed away that my grandmother started narrating at bedtime who this old frail woman really was. I will not go into the details of how my Omama ended up on Shark Island. I already expand on this in the publication that I presume will be launched sometime soon. However, I want to reflect on how I was always in awe about how my grandmother lo uh, um, looked so different from my great-grandmother, especially because she had fine, long ca Caucasian hair. My granny looked nothing like the typical Nama woman. I only learned later that she was the child of a German man, hence the fine ca Caucasian hair. According to my grandmother's narrative, they were three children, two girls and one boy, all of mixed German and Nama blood and products of the German-established genocide concentration camp of Okawao near Wilhelmsdam Dal in the Karabib area of present-day Namibia. My great-grandmother was from the Friedrich clan of the Batani people, the Aman. She was the niece of Cornelius Friedrich, on whose head General von Trotta declared 3,000 Deutschmark when he ordered the extermination of all Namas. Omama was first rounded up in Batani with those who were taken to Shark Island. We all know what happened there. The skull of her nephew, Gaub Cornelius Friedrich, is still somewhere unknown to us after it was packed in a box to Germany. My grandmother used to tell us, people's head were cut off and the woman had to clean them like you clean the head of a goat. But she never named these people as Germans. She called them Koe Oreb. When you literally translate Koe Oreb from Nama to English, it means man-eaters or cannibals. I presume my granny didn't know that the scraped skulls were taken for experiments, but thought that the skulls were eaten, just like you eat a goat head as a delicacy in Nama culture, hence her reference to Koi Oreb. As kids, we were so scared, thinking our heads would be cut off and wondering when the Koi Oreb would come to get us. When she referred to Karibib, she used to say Karibib is a place where they made Nama men and women work like slaves for the white people. As kids, we dreaded this evil place. When images so vivid are narrated to you as a child, they never leave you until the day you die. As you grow up and observe life around you as it unfolds and also within you, the pieces of the puzzle slowly come together as you try to make some sense of who you are and why you are where you are today. I also want to share with you another story of a relative of mine. She was the wife of Gaub Cornelius Friedrich, whose skull is still owed by the German government to us as his immediate relatives. This story has been narrated to us by our elders um, through generations of storytelling. Magdalena Witboy 
married as Friedrich, was the wife of Galp Cornelius Friedrich and the daughter of Ota Manzip Hendrik Witboy, whose Bible and work were recently returned to Namibia. After Ota Manzip was fatally wounded on the battlefield near Falkras, a number of the remaining Nama fighters, um, after some continued battles, opted for peace agreement, agreements in good faith. Cornelius Friedrich and Samuel Isaac were one of those who gave up and who went into a peace agreement. However, unfortunately, these peace agreements um, turned into concentration camps because there was no peace kept. The people were taken to concentration camps. Cornelius Friedrich was taken in chains from Kitmanswap from Tamchas uh, uh, to Kitmanswap near, uh, near Betani, later to be moved to Shark Island. His wife, Oma Magdalena, had two daughters named Sarah and Johanna. When she arrived at Shark Island with the rest of the prisoners, she was separated from her two infant children and taken to a room on the island. She never saw her children again. again. Here she was stripped naked, instructed to bath. My grandmother used to talk about this blue soap and I could never understand what blue sh soap she was talking about. But apparently they were ordered to bath in blue soap and this blue soap apparently caused intense itching over the entire body. In this room, she end endured ins insistent rape as the German soldiers took turns violating her body. It is narrated that Oma Magdalena almost became mentally ill from the rape. From this room, she was able to observe through the window the other female prisoners scraping skulls. In her mind, she felt it would be better to scrape skulls than to go through the hell of rape and ask the guards to be released from the scale scrap, uh, skull scraping duty. Together with her other fellow inmates, she boiled heads of many of familiar faces uh, in order to scrape them. Many of the women, unable to mentally bear this duty, jumped into the sea and either drowned or were eaten by sharks. One day, as the narrative is told by our parents, Oma Magdalena was given the head of her husband to scrape. This was the first time that she saw him bodiless after arriving at Shark Island. Oma Magdalena perished on Shark Island shortly after scraping the, the head of her husband, Cornelius Friedrich. Until today, the whereabouts of his skull is unknown and there is no indication of where the rest of his body was buried. Germany owes my family and indeed the Nama people an explanation. These stories remind me that the existing official narrative and history books on the genocide have never really dealt with the experience of Nama and Ovaherero women during the genocide. In particular, the entry of German men into the family trees of the Nama and the Ovaherero during this time period is a very silent theme. <coughs> this entry may have been either through outright intimate violence and coercion, or wanted relationships that nonetheless were based on a huge power differential between German soldiers and female prisoners who had been stripped of most, if not all, their rights in the colony. These facts of German fatherhood with Nama and Ovaherero women during and after the genocide also make the caginess and resistance of, Ge of the German Namibian community to <clears throat> act for, repar uh, for repar repar reparatory justice even more deeply frustrating and unsettling. Sometimes it is as if the German, the Namibian German community does not want to be associated 
with their bastard relatives, as we are often called. For as long as I can remember, since my childhood, children of mixed blood, including myself, are referred to as half nakis Indeed, a very derogatory term, meaning half-breeds. Oma Magdalena's story and the disappearance of her husband's remains reminds me also of the religious customs of the Nama people in relation to the human remains of our families. Even before Christianity, the Nama people believed in a supreme being known by the name of Tzwikaw. In Nama religion, he is the creator of the entire universe and the giver of life to all creatures through his powerful spirit. He has the power over rain, over the wind, and over, over all life forces. The Nama people believed that the human soul returns to its master, the creator Tzwikaw, upon a person's death. Equally, the human body is created from the soil of the earth and thus must be returned to the soil. The graves in which the remains will be buried are marked extraordinary into monuments as per our customs. In the Nama religion, the messenger of goodwill of Tzwikaup was named Haiti Ebeb. He died under extraordinary circumstances and rose from the death many times according to Nama folklore. His graves were turned into monuments made of rocks. As people who passed by the grave, each would say praises and add another rock. Many of these graves can still today be found in the southern parts of Namibia. According to Nama culture, the spirit of the deceased remains restless until it is returned to the soil from which it, it is made by the Creator. Keeping human remains in museums denies us our right to practice our customs. The skulls and the remains of our people are the remains of our people, and it is only culturally appropriate to have it handed over to us for the purpose of a dignified burial. As for the archival materials, um, they have our valuable, they are our valuable materials, and we have the right to claim them. It is important to prove to Germany and to the world that they did not find us in a static state. We too are in motion, in tandem with the then prevailing historical conditions. We are bound morally, socially, and spiritually to ensure the burial of the remains of our families. And no individual, neither an institution or a government has got the right to keep the remains of our families and for us to have to enter into some sort of negotiations with us. These are our families, these are our belongings, and without any condition must be returned to us. So many... So many lawyers and highly learned people are sitting here today. Maybe you can help me understand through your deliberations how I can be denied my right to achieve restorative justice. Perhaps you can help me understand why the German government refuses to sit at the table with me and listen to me. When we talk about restorative justice and reparations, the impression is created both in Namibia and in Germany that we want to line up our pockets as a highly placed Namibian politician often says. The illusion is created that a special status uh, uh, given to Namibia, packaged in monetary development aid, will change anything. It is only making things worse. How pitifully wrong 
they are when they think that a bunch of development aid is going to make any difference. It is not about money. It is about the restoration of integrity. It is about my dignity. It is about me being a human being. It is about mutual respect. It is about seeing me for who I am and not throwing money at me, but respecting me and seeing me as a human being who is the perfect creation of God. I am the perfect creation of God, and this fact shall never again be taken away from me or denied, uh, uh, or denied me by any government. The fact that the German government refuses to talk directly with the Nama people already indicates to the fact that the German government does not see us as human beings who are fully capable of representing ourselves, but that we need to be represented by other people. You don't see me. That is why you don't want to talk to me. And this is where the fundamental problem lies. As long as you don't see me as a human being, then there is nothing else that you and I can discuss. As far as I am concerned, I know that it is indeed the blood of our ancestors which will eventually water our freedom, and that they, our ancestors, call on us to rise against injustice. Yes, we hear the whispers of our ancestors as they become louder and louder. We see their scattered bones taking shape and coming to life. We have no choice but to speak up. To my German brothers and sisters, I am here to say, listen to me, hear my voice. Equally allow me to hear your voice so that you can free yourself of the guilt that you carry and I can free myself of the shame that I carry for being a bastard child. I thank you. Um, that was very strong. Um, thank you for, for reminding us that the German civilizers were not only killers and robbers of land and of resources, but also rapists. And that cannot be reiterated enough, uh, because all, we hear from all the colonial situations that uh, massive violations have taken place and that has to be reminded also because this is a continuity until today that in nearly every armed conflict women are raped and this is a crime which is nearly not addressed um, in, in any kind of judicial forum. And um, I'm sorry to say, uh, Sima, I have difficulties to explain that as well as I have difficulties to explain to you as a German lawyer how it can be that um, the skulls haven't given back I can tell you that there is a bureaucrat, one of these bureaucratic excuses, and that is we don't know where the skulls are because we, had, we haven't archived them correctly. And that is something um, that is so blatantly ignorant and so blatantly um, against every ethical and moral feeling that we can only um, claim to the Germans that they should now late, late, late um, at least archive what the artifacts, the, the skulls, and everything they robbed, and which is still here, and make it make it available for you in a in a respectful way, as 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 you pointed out. 
So thank you very much, Sima. And I have good news for you, and thank you also for the reminder, because um, everybody wants to read something from Sima. The publication, who she's, um, which she said is coming out soon, it has already coming out, and it's down, it's, it's, it's laying out there on the table, and we missed to mention that fact. And um, it gives me also the opportunity to thank um, um, Judith Hackmark, um, who uh, was, is the responsible for having organized this um, event together with um, the, my team from ECCHR, but also with Maike from, from the Academy of um, Fine Arts. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left uh, for you, Sima, to comment on, on Joshua's uh, remarks and from you, Joshua, to comment on her remarks, but only if you like to. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, it was almost as if, as if some of the points that I, that, I, that I raised in my presentation, as if uh, Joshua had seen it, a fundamental question that remains in my mind is uh, um, the, 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 the legal perspectives and how those legal perspectives can be used for justice. Because now it seems to me that uh, the law is used in a very one-sided manner. And of course, only the lawyers can, uh, uh, John is here, he's, he's the, the, the expert on this from a Namibian perspective, but can tell us how do we as indigenous people, as people who have lost our rights, um, reclaim our rights. I think that is something that is very important for me. Also something that Joshua raised is about uh, um, that restorative justice is not about money. It's not, it, it, yes, it is also about returning of property. It uh, is about uh, uh, reparations and compensation. But for me, it runs much deeper than that. It is about my dignity as a human being. It is about my integrity. It is about me having lost my language, my culture, my religion. Um, my, my, surname, my surname is Leipert. Actually, it is Lup Lupet. And just shortly after independence, my father uh, um, received a letter from a German family who wanted to know where did he get the surname from? And so, as a, as a way of surviving, Nama people had to change their names into German names so that they could survive. And, and through this process, we lost something. We, we lost who we are. And for me, restorative justice is about seeking, going back, backwards and, and seeking wh wh where did we lose what and how do we reclaim that and how do we work together as Germans and as Namas and as, and as Ovaherero people to reclaim what was lost. So I think for me that is, that is something that is, that is very, very fundamental. So just with those few words, um, I would like to um, thank Joshua for some of his reflections. I, it's a, it's, I'm deeply moved by your testimony and I think the power with which you express it. And I think what, what comes out most to me, uh, as I guess more as a legal scholar, is that we always thought that the issue of subject and object was out there 150 years ago. The issue of subject and object is here today. The fact that the German government will not speak to you is the German government's failure to respect you as a subject. And I think that is something that is really, really powerful in your testimony, and that is something that we have to think about. You know, colleagues, when you think about law itself, and we, we've celebrated ideas about democracy, but I often say to my, my students, imagine that democracy, that ancient Greek democracy. That, you know, what was it set up for? Who were the ones who did that? If you pictured, if you had a grainy image of who were the people who were in that ancient democracy, they had two things in common. They were all men, first of all, and they all owned property. And what they were concerned about was in writing more rules that would prevent that property from getting out of their hands. So at the heart of the legal project 
law has always been an instrument of the powerful written in the interests of the powerful. And the link between law and justice, that has not existed. We have seen law as a set of rules, but law is just a route to justice. We have forgotten about the justice. And what you portrayed today is the deepening legacy of injustice with every single time and every single year and every single moment and decade and century that this justice is un uncorrected. I think yours is a powerful call for us to realize that colonial crime isn't something out there in the deep distant history that we can pretend to forget about. It's a real legacy among us. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, thank you very much, Sima. And um, thank you all, and we are now inviting the first panel or the second panel um, to come on the stage. Thank you.